Our role as educators is to transform people, to take them from a particular point where they are in, in their lives and learning journey and to take them to a, a different point. However, transforming a human being is a very, very difficult exercise and it requires that we understand all the contextual issues that might be impacting on that individual. Um, it's, a, it's a challenging, a very challenging uh, task. Um, we all know that identity, time on task equals performance. But how do we come to be who we are? How is our identity formed? How do we understand ourselves as learners or mathematicians or people studying science or history or being in a formal classroom or learning informally? How does our identity link to our learning and our learning journey? This is what uh, this uh, program is going to deal with and my task is to introduce you to some issues uh, that impact on our identity. First point I want to make is that we are born into a family, into a community. It's not a choice. We don't say to some higher being, uh, please, I want to be born um, African, African American and in Detroit, or I want to be born uh, Egyptian and in Egypt, or I want to be born um, Swedish in Sweden, or to be born it an Italian American in, in America. None of us ask for that. Uh, we are born into families and as a consequence our life is determined because we become in and through people. We're not born with a language, we're not born with particular taste for food, we're not born with a predisposition towards faith. Uh, nobody is born to be a particular kind of person or to belong to a particular kind of nation. We are determined, but as we grow and as we learn, we make choices which determine other people and determine our own trajectory. Now, why is this important? It is important because that thing that we have no choice over, who we were born to and perhaps what nationality or ethnicity we have, is nothing we can either be ashamed of or proud of. What we need to regard as uh, what makes us who we are is the choices we start making and how we value our heritage and the way our heritage interacts with the heritage of others and into the future. Uh, many people today say that we are born the way we are and that we just simply have to tolerate and understand each other. That is not the best way forward. The best way forward is to try and understand ourselves as cultured beings and not just say somebody else is cultured, somebody else has ethnicity, and that we have to tolerate them. Uh, although that's, that's an advance on some other kinds of behaviours, what we're going to examine is how our choices determine the society that we're a part of, and as educators in particular, how it opens up opportunities for those learners who come to us from so many different backgrounds. The second point I want to make is that human beings have always and are by nature creative and mobile. Um, we were uh, produced somewhere in Africa way, way back at some time, and from that one singular point we moved as a species right across the planet. And in that movement uh, we learned different ways of engaging with the environment, different ways of engaging with each other. We produced our own languages, we produced dialects, we produced different faiths. But the point I want to make here is that there is only one human race. Despite all our variety, we are connected powerfully uh, as humans. And our humanity uh, is the most important part about us as a species. But our mobility remains today a feature of who we are as people. The third point I want to make is that all of us in our humanity have exactly the same human needs and desires. And in fact, realising these human needs and desires in a language or in food or in faith or in any kind of habit, habits is what produces culture. 
Culture is a consequence of meeting the needs, exactly the same needs, but in different times with different technologies and uh, different environments, the uh, realization of that need or desire has had a different manifestation. And of course, through human history, we've also organized ourselves as peoples in different ways to satisfy those needs and desires as hunters and gatherers, as farmers, as industrialists. And in fact, um, if you look at the, the different organizations across all of human history, you'll discover that that one that we call our own uh, in, in America or in Australia or in Canada, for example, Western civilization has had the shortest existence in the whole of human history and came as a consequence of uh, inventing tools and, and engaging with people uh, to meet our needs and desires. The third point is that once move, uh, human beings settled into uh, farming communities, they started counting and categorizing. They categorized trees, they categorized birds, they categorized animals, they counted, they traded, they exchanged. And being the sort of creative uh, people that they were trying to get advantage for their group, they also shifted to categorizing each other. Uh, positively and with negative effects. But it was an, uh, a development that came in the 19th and 20th century that started to consider people as groups that were defined by certain features which were visible to the world and which could be categorized in the same way as you would categorize other creatures and living parts of the planet. In 1795, a scholar named uh, John, Jonathan Friedrich uh, Blumenbach was writing a medical thesis. His medical thesis involved examining the skulls of humans across the planet. And as part of doing that, he came up with an idea of uh, uh, naming the characteristics of different groups of people. And he came up with a set of these, which he put in his thesis. He came up with a group called Caucasians, a group he called Mongolians, another group he called Ethiopians, another one he called Americans, meaning for then at that time Native Americans, in the indigenous peoples of the Americas, and Malays. When he put these groups together, he didn't put them together in a way that intended to uh, imply a hierarchy or that some groups were more competent than other groups or more capable than other groups. It was what he saw in the phenotypical differences and he made them into a grouping and published them in his PhD. In time, though, these categories morphed in ways that, has, that have ended up with some categories that today we are still struggling with. Uh, the categories linked to ethnicities were used uh, and shifted. Different groups have added different uh, names, but uh, during the 19th uh, century, what we got is uh, a thinking in so-called Western civilization that Caucasians somehow were the most beautiful of this group. They were put at the center of a group that was called M Mongolian and Malay and Caucasian and Negro and American, uh, me meaning, of course, uh, still Native American. But very quickly, uh, amongst these people who thought these categories mattered and who put them in a hierarchical order, like at the tree of man with the uh, uh, Caucasian or the Aryan at the very top, very quickly they moved to just one feature of the phenotypical differences. A very strange kind of move indeed, and a, and a, and a move which is with us still today. They, so they moved from those categories of ethnicity to the categories of pigment. So the races of man started to be described as red, as yellow, as white, as brown, as as black. And although that might seem a strange thing to do, that pigment would determine culture, that pigment would determine uh, your place in the planet, that pigment would t determine your uh, place in the hierarchy of humanity. Nonetheless, these were the kinds of con concepts that, that developed. And along with it came uh, notions of what we might call xenophobia, uh, that 
uh, created anxieties about people who were different from you, but based on so little knowledge of who and what they were, and worse than that, based simply on one aspect of a, of, of a phenotype.